thank you. And uh, I'm Mike Dan, the associate head coach. I've been with Danny for 12 years, served in two different stints back in the 70s, and again in the last 10 years after I retired. So it's been a great run for us. But it's my pleasure today, with, with a great deal of pride, that I get to introduce to you my friend Dan Miles. Dan came to Oregon Tech uh, with the intention of staying about three years, really his resume as an instructor and a coach, and that was in 1971. He just completed his 41st year at Oregon Tech and his 40th year as the head basketball coach at Oregon Tech. He uh, has a unique distinction of having served with every president that's been here, interim president that's ever served at Oregon Tech. In addition, he was a part of a transition from Oregon OTI, Oregon Technical Institute, to Oregon Institute of Technology and all the philosophical changes that took place as we moved from a vocational school to a high-end technical institution. He was a part of that, that transition. Dan's been the basketball coach here for 40 years, uh, completed, just completed his 40th year. Uh, he has 937 wins, which is the second most of any coach in the history of college basketball. Uh, he's been awarded a lot of honors uh, while he's been here. He's won two national championships. He's had four Final Four teams. He uh, been Coach of the Year, National Coach of the Year, uh, two times. He's been the Conference Coach of the Year numerous times, taking his team to 17 national tournaments, had four Final Four finishes in addition to the two national championships. Um, he's also a member of the Hall of Fame at Denver High School. He's a member of the Hall of Fame at Southern Oregon University. He's a member of the Hall of Fame of the Oregon Sports Foundation, a member of the Hall of Fame uh, with the NAIA, the Kentucky Basketball Hall of Fame. But probably the most significant award, and the one that he seems to value the most, is an award he won in 2008, which was the Champion of Character Coach of the Year Award, which is given annually to the one coach in NAIA basketball, football, baseball, whatever, that most exemplifies the five basic core values of the Champions of Character program. Values, uh, respect, responsibility, sportsmanship, integrity, and service to his community. Um, related to that, Dan is you know, not only an icon in college basketball, but an icon around his community. And, uh, but you would never know it if you lived here. Uh, those of us who know him uh, value his sense of humor, uh, we value his humbleness, and occasionally we value his practical jokes. Um, <laughs> not often. Um, more, more significantly, Dan never says no in the community. You'll see him working with our Special Olympians. He runs summer camps for kids. Uh, all kinds of random acts of kindness. Uh, I know last year we were preparing to go to the national tournament and somebody called and wanted to come down at a certain time to talk about what, what it's like to be a champion. He finds time in his schedule as well as our preparation to go and take care of that need. Um, most recently, Dan has been uh, spent last year with Athletes in Action last summer. They were in Kenya and Rwanda. And uh, I think a testimony of the kind of man that he is, he found that there's a young child there that he's sort of hooked onto. And, and Dan has made arrangements now, and uh, the family of this young child receives money from uh, Dan on a basketball team on a regular basis. And so, it's so with a great deal of pleasure that I introduce my friend, my colleague, my boss, uh, Dan Miles. Thank you. Well, you know, first of all, just uh, Mike, uh, I was coaching Legion baseball over in Medford, and Mike was playing for these great Klamath Falls teams. Uh, so uh, that's the first time I met him, actually, he was playing ball against me. And I was fortunate enough, uh, he was working in the school system here in Klamath Falls, and I was able to hire him in the late 70s with me a couple of years then and we went to the national tournament in 1979 and uh, had a very good team back then a long time ago and then he was assistant superintendent here at the uh, time of falls and after he retired i was fortunate enough to get mike to come back with us and again he's been great great uh deal of our success is because of uh, the great job he's done and, and like i said we're great friends he uh i get excited sometimes about Doing, putting something in and practice, so we might want to wait until tomorrow, coach. <laughs> it keeps me, uh, keeps me level-headed, and so. But again, it's. Uh, I was asked the other day to come and talk a little bit about uh, 
our basketball program and kind of a little bit of its history. And then feel free to ask any questions. You know, it's a, uh, I'd like to keep it really informal. Uh, first of all, I, I came here, uh, Mike said I was going to be here about two or three years. And I really felt living in Medford, I didn't, Time of Falls was never, never one of the places I ever expected to live. And uh, I was going to be here about two or three years out of uh, goal of being a Pac-10 coach or a Pac-8 coach at that time, and either basketball, football, or baseball. I played three sports in college. And so I actually, I came here as an assistant coach in football, basketball, and baseball. And growing up in Medford, Oregon at that time, I played on a lot of championship teams. Southern Oregon played on championship teams. But that year I came to, to Oregon Tech, uh, I went from the so-called penthouse to the outhouse in a hurry, because we went 0-9 in football, 1-21 in basketball, and 3-23 in baseball. And I was coaching third base, and I remember I didn't get to go do this hardly at all. <laughs> wave anybody around. We walked a couple guys in, we won a couple games, but but it was it was an absolute, I thought, disaster, except I found out something real special. There's a lot of winners on losing teams, and there was a lot of losers on winning teams. And I remember back in Medford, we had a big, very big high school, had some great teammates, great friends, but there were some of the guys on our team were I thought were losers as people, uh, the way they trained and did different things. And here, I remember going up against University of Nevada, Las Vegas, University of Nevada, Reno. 185-pound freshman lineman against 270-pounders, and they'd get rolled up, pancaked, and get get back up and take them on again and, and do that over and over. And I'll tell you what, it's real easy to quit. I found out that first year there were some real special people. I'd never been on that end of the uh, you know uh, spectrum as far as being in a losing situation, but that year I really Really learned an awful lot. I learned also I didn't like losing. That was not a lot of fun. So the next year I, I uh, had an opportunity to be uh, head basketball coach. I put my name in, and uh, I didn't think I'd get it, but I was named head basketball coach here my second year. Uh, I was also head baseball coach and offensive coordinator in football. I stayed in those three sports for several years, thinking that you know uh, the head coach here in football later on thought I could be in the Pac-10 as a defensive back coach. And baseball is my first love. Uh, I'd actually gone to Oregon State originally on a baseball scholarship. And uh, my three boys all played D1 baseball. So baseball is probably our favorite sport in our family. Basketball, I, I started at Southern Oregon uh, in basketball and was a second team all-conference player there, but I thought that was my third sport. I'd never really get a, you know, probably never coached basketball. Well, the thing that happened to me here, I fell in love with the community. Uh, this is one of the greatest communities as far as backing people. American Legion ball, when I used to coach that in the playoffs, we get 3,500, 4,000 sometimes the ball games fill the stadium. Uh, basketball here, we get the best crowds in the West Coast, uh, small college basketball probably uh, in the nation. Our home court, they have a formula that now that they talk about the home court advantage. We're always in the top five in the nation because of our crowd. You know, we, we won 57 straight at home now. We got pretty high altitude here, which helps but also, and we're used to it, but uh, the fans are really, really something. We, we, uh, we tell our kids with 10 minutes to go in the game, if we're within 10 points, we're gonna win. They believe it. And so, so it's been one of the things that's really, and it's not only back in the basketball, but this community's really been tremendous in so many different areas. They, we have food drives, things like that, and it's just a tremendous the amount of food and different things uh, this community does. So that became, Oregon Tech became very special to me. Our first year, I took over a 1-21 in team, and uh, so I wrote to everybody in the country. Uh, there was a Street Smith's magazine, so everybody was, Armo mentioned All-American High School, got a letter from me. And uh, that first year, we got three pretty good players, junior college kids, and we ended up winning 11 games that first year, which was pretty good coming off a of 1-21. in The second year, we won 14. And, uh, and we were in the Evergreen Conference back then. That was with Central Washington, Western Washington. Uh, we had to go all the way to Bellingham. I was close to three sports. I, I went to Bellingham three times that year. We were going all over the place. I remember coming home one time. We had a triple header. We got rained out. Got a triple header. I'm about 25 years old, driving a state car. And I, have a, I pay a work study kid next to me. I said, I want you to hit me in the arm every one minute to keep me awake. You know, that was really you know, dangerous. You know. But, you know, we didn't have, we didn't travel quite as well as we, we travel on a bus now, or I wouldn't, Coach and I wouldn't be, we wouldn't be coaching now. We had to drive, but, uh, so, 
it, it was interesting back then. You know, we had the three sports and, and a real tough league. In our third year, we went, went we won 25 games, and uh, we were 19 and one. We started uh, one freshman, three sophomores, and everybody over six five, and the crowds started coming. We uh, when I first got the job, you could have shot a can in the gym, not anybody, but the crowds started coming, and uh, there would be people sitting on the floor like the center section here is from the base, I mean from the floor to the sideline. that up my first year because I told the kids we may not you know be as well coached we may not be I'm a rookie coach I said we may not have as good a player I mean but one thing we can do we can out hustle everybody we play so we became the hustle on owls and that's how the name hustle on owls came along I didn't ask for permission back then but after a while they nobody knew who did it so <laughs> we got away with it and uh, so went along for Several years, and, and we know we had a uh, team in '79 with the national championship. Back then, only one team out of 16 from our area had a chance to go. We had the first year we went back, we had one scholarship, and we were playing teams of 10, 11. In fact, the first year we played Gardner Webb, North Carolina, in the national tournament. They had uh, John Drew, they led the NBA in offensive rebounds for eight straight years. All I can remember, uh, they'd shoot the ball, and there'd be these eight, eight arms up there tipping the ball until it went in. You know. We, we were pretty small, and uh, but they just had the talent back there. That's before, that's back in the, about the time the Southeast Conference started letting black players play and stuff, and it's kind of the color color barrier back then. So a lot of the Gramblings and all those real good schools with the great players were still playing, you know, against teams like ourselves. And then pretty soon after the Open uh, gave the Black athlete, an opportunity to play, and then things started. Uh, they started going to major colleges, and it changed uh, <clears throat> changed the scope of uh, NAI and NCAA. Um, one thing about NAI, we're NAI. We're we're the same level as NCAA Division II, if you ever wondered. We're, you know, our record against NCAA Division One teams is 20 and 32. And some of those wins were back when they were Division II. Our record against NCAA Division Two teams is about. I don't know, 160 and 130 or whatever. So we're an NCAA Division II level program. Um, I like to say the last 15 years, our basketball teams had a 298, it was the lowest of Q. And um, uh, we had a 324 this year. Our teams have a very, we have very good student athletes. We're very proud of that. I decided about 15, 16 years ago, I was gonna, my recruiting was gonna be mostly freshmen and I was gonna redshirt about every kid. Red shirt means bring it. Eighty-two percent of college kids take five years to go to school, four plus years. And our kids, uh, you know, they're involved in basketball, and, and uh, you know, but we get good students. We red shirt them the first year so they get get going academically, and uh, that first year they can learn our system. And then the second year they're freshmen. There isn't a kid that red shirts doesn't really appreciate the fact he did after he's done so. And some of them will graduate two terms into their senior year or whatever. And that's not bad either because they got to jump on the other kids that may be getting a job before they graduate in June. We've only had two kids that, that played for us that didn't graduate, uh, that played four years. One of them, uh, Herb McKeach, became the Dr. J of Australia. He's made about three times more money than I ever have. Uh, he was a pro player and a great player over there. Didn't get his degree, but did very well and uh, he still lives there. We had another young man that's uh, about six, six credits, I believe, uh, what else like that? two classes away from graduating. And so we're, we're pleased with that, um, what, what we've done with the kids, uh, what they've done academically, they're all smart and they're all coach, so, but they're, uh, they've done very well. Um, the last few years, uh, we've, uh, the last actually six, 15, six, the first year 
we, I decided to go mostly all freshmen. We started four freshmen, we only won 12 games. But the, since that time, we've averaged about 29 wins a year for 16 years. Uh, one thing about the grades, too, uh, compared, I think this level is the best level of student athlete sports, athletics. You probably heard the rumors of cheating at all these different schools. Um, last year, I had an opportunity to go with Athletes and Actions, a Christian based group that went, we went to Kenya and Rwanda, where I got, had a chance to coach the coaches from those countries and then worked in the orphanage and do a lot of other things with the Christian part of it, but it was a tremendous experience. On, on the trip, I had the starting point guard from Butler, his, uh, his coach, and I had the uh, coach of the best player in America right now in high school. And separately, I asked one of them, how many teams at the Division I level are cheating? And I, I was guessing 30%. He said 80, and I asked the other guy separately, and he said 85. And he says that there's so much money now at that level Coaches are getting paid four million. Uh, kids are coming in and playing for, you know, they'll play two two semesters and then quit school and go to the NBA and stuff. And so I think the integrity at that level is really shaky. And uh, but our level, you know, we have uh, right around four full rides. We have 17 kids in the program. Not hardly hardly any of the kids get very much money. You know, they they're paying almost all their money. So so we are uh, at our level. We play up to six scholarships and we don't have the money to do that we you, uh, do with what we have and uh, all of our sports are kind of like that but our kids I think all 11 sports a year ago I believe were all over a three point of cue. I had a friend that coached at New Mexico State several years ago and he got a $50,000 bonus if the team had a two point of cue. and in seven years he never got the bonus and, and so that's right. A little bit of the difference between the grades of kids, you know, programs like ours and the NEIA compared to some of the bigger schools. Um, it's been, you know, the kind of kids we have here. It's just been great. We had an opportunity a few years ago to, to be the first college team to ever go uh, take a team to China. It was about 2005, summer of 2000. I'm in summer of 2004, after they graduated. 2005, it's something like that. Well, we went, uh, we had won the national championship, we won the Champion of Character Award as a team, and so U.S. Basketball Academy, which is located up the McKinsey River, that's where Yao Ming, the Chinese national team, would come over and practice all the time. So, uh, they called me from up there and said that they'd like us to represent the United States and go into China, be the first team over there. Well. We said that was great. So out of my basketball camp, I was able to pay for 10 of our kids. We could only have several kids had jobs, couldn't leave. And then uh, the Ning company over there, which is the equivalent of Nike here, paid $52,000 for us for flying us all over the country. We played their World University team twice, and then we got to go play in three different cities against the pro team. And uh, we, we lost the first two games by uh, one point, three points, and then we Played their pro team, and the, the, our driver said, "Well, we're supposed to lose by 30 each game because they're professionals." And we had five freshmen on the trip; two of them had never played in our system, and uh, we lost the five games by a total of 11 points. But the interesting thing was the altitude. We were, first place we played, uh, we played in Beijing first at 95 degrees, and uh, really hot in the gym and everything. And then big crowd, probably 6,000 people. Then we went to Luxy, which is 6,800 feet, and they paid an equivalent of $90 per American to get uh, to watch the game. And so it was, and a lot of Communist Party members there and stuff, and it was a big deal. The next night, we asked, we asked our interpreter, and he didn't really speak real good English, but we asked them how far the next trip was. We flew to that place, and the next was going to be on a bus trip. One guy told us four, another guy said six, the other guy said two. They were right, it was 14 hours. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we drove 14 hours to the next place and, and uh, uh, played there. We lost by a couple points. But it was interesting in that game where we called timeout. Our guys broke the huddle, dribbling up court, we're down three with 30 seconds to go. 
my guys started pointing at the clock. I look up there, they'd added a point to there, and now we're down four. <laughs> it's hard to catch up. But, but after the game, they apologized for how the refs were cheating. Because they travel with, the, they have two buses, we have a bus, their team has a bus, the referees travel with them. And so, the last game they asked us, you know, we don't have to play because we did get cheated. And say, hey, we're, these games don't mean anything as far as, you know. And so the last game we played for $10,000. And, uh, you know, they figured they had, they had the Communist Party there, you know, they're going to win the game. But the guy flew in from Beijing and said that he, uh, he said they'll promise they'll be the same refs, but they'll be fair. And, uh, and they were. We had a three-pointer at the buzzer to, to win and lock, miss a shot. But that game we played 11,200 feet higher than Mount McLaughlin out here. We had to have oxygen on the bench, sleeping at night. I was in fairly good shape. I couldn't breathe at night. I just just laying there in bed. And we had a little 5-5 five -five All American. He wanted to see if he could play the whole game. He went 14, scored 14 points the first half and didn't score the second half. You know, you're with lactic acid and your legs are all that stuff. But it was it was quite a quite a trip. But everybody lost 10 pounds because all we ate was watermelon. My wife was with us. And she has this one six nine Chinese guy, and they, they were big, seven foot six nine. And, and so she said, "What is that? Is it, is it one of these?" And he said, "Yeah, I reached out, ate it, you know." And, but I, I think they had dog and all kinds of stuff, and so we we decided to we had nice banquets, real nice you know banquets, but but everybody uh, ate watermelon. And then we finally got back to Beijing and went to Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> the problem is the chickens there must be one that tall because the chicken legs were about that big. You know? <laughs> So they had short chickens in China. So. But, but we had a, uh, that was a great trip for us. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's been so much fun. You know, I can't wait to get to work each morning. The kind of kids we have, it's uh, uh, just been a lot of fun these 40 years. People ask me how much longer, I'm 65 now. And my wife gave me five more years. And uh, my kids say, let dad keep coaching until he's, I like to coach until, uh, you know, I didn't want to come to work. Or, like next time I drive to Medford with my blinker on, that might be a <laughs> sign that I might want to give it up, you know. So, uh, but I still enjoy it. And this guy here said he'd stick with me. And Bobby Thompson, I don't know if you've heard of him on the radio, does a tremendous job. He said he'd, he'd hang in there with me and as long as I keep coaching. So it's been a great ride, a lot of fun. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention, uh, uh, Marlon mentioned, I don't know if it would be interesting to you, but we have. I came up with a formula 40 years ago of how I how I uh, rate my players. I just did a video. Uh, a company did it from Iowa came out, did a video, and actually I only got 15 percent, so I didn't, I'm not making a lot on it. But uh, they sold over almost sixty thousand dollars on the video, and it's been real popular around the country. But I have a I have a value point system we call it. And when I was playing back in the 60s, you know, they kept rebounds, they kept points, uh, shooting percentage, things like that. They didn't keep assists very well. They didn't keep charges, things that helped you win ball games. And so I always felt, you know, I, I thought it kind of led to people being selfish in basketball. I wanted to come up with a way where guys could learn to play the game the right way. And that doing, drawing a charge or getting assists is just as important as scoring a bucket. So, came up with a, a mathematical system that I've used for 40 years. And I really think it's been a big part of our success. And uh, I did, a, I remember doing a clinic in New York uh, about four years ago. And Steve Nash had been traded from to Phoenix for Stephon Marbury. Stephon Marbury played about 1.5 one, one in my value point system. And Steve Nash had played about 1.66. And I said at the clinic that, that year to watch this summer that Phoenix will win about 30 more games than than uh, what they did a year ago because they're replacing a selfish player with a very good uh, team player. And sure enough, it's like 29 more wins. Their 31 is within one. Uh, a few years ago, uh, the Lakers played Detroit and I did my value point system on both teams in the playoffs. I said Detroit would win in four games. They won in five, but they, they were six points ahead in the fourth game with a minute to go or could have swept. And so it's a great thing for us to kind of co compare teams, uh, compare our players. And the last or well, probably several years, we've been in the top five in the nation in the turnover ratio. 
We lead the nation almost every year in fewest turnovers. And, uh, and if you've seen us play, a lot of people say they like to see watch us play because everybody touches the ball. We have real good movement and a very little self, uh, selfishness in the program. And so that we really feel that's been a very big plus for us. And the kids buy into it. You know, the first year, that's one reason we redshirt them. They get to buy into it. And we've been able to turn some kids around who maybe only lacked in one area. We had one kid, for example, that after several scrimmages said, Coach, I don't think I can play for you because I'm only playing at 1.05. So we looked at his stats and he had like 14 assists and 25, 30 turnovers. And I said, Josh, if you just switch those around, don't try to make the thread the needle pass or the 50-50 pass, and just make the basic passes. That, that's, that's, you don't pass so well, so let the other guys get the ball to the post. You do the other things because you're a great defender. He figured it out in a five minute time period. He just said, okay, I'm gonna do that. He played a 166 for me for his career, was one of our all time great players. But it's really helped kids like him, you know, if they have a weakness, we try to show them what it is, and then they play to their strengths, and then they work on the weaknesses of practice. So that's been a, a beneficial to us too. Okay, I babble on to any questions. Yeah. So um, I'd just like to know, so with your limited scholarships and stuff, how do you actually recruit kids in? Or do you just, like, kids got to want to be here? Or? Well, what I've done is, one thing, I, I love the Rimrock Savages. And those are kids on this side of the mountain. You know, like Prineville and Boardman and Culver, because and, Oregon Tech looks great to them. Now, I think kids in Beaverton, you know, they're in the big city and all that kind of stuff, you know, I don't want kids to come here and say, oh, God, I'm going to Oregon Tech. I want kids that Oregon Tech is special to them. And so I, I usually have three foreign kids on the team each year. We have a Serbian right now. So I coach in France. I coached seven years in France. I've coached and you know, been able to coach a lot of places. And the, the French kid I met when he was 14, couldn't speak English. I gave him my card. He said, if you ever speak English, give me a call. Mm -hmm. Three years later, I got a call. I came over here, and he actually spoke at the commencement, did a tremendous job, he became about a 3-7 student, he's now making about 200000 a year in a company up in Portland, and uh, here's a little skinny 14-year-old, but came but Oregon Tech was, that was the place. The kid from Serbia that we have here, he loves Oregon Tech. We had a, uh, four kids from the Ivory Coast, Oregon Tech, you know, so my recruiting, I want kids, uh, had, in fact, we just signed another Australian, we have a New Zealand kid too. And so we want kids who want to be here. Those foreign kids are great students. They're going to, you know, they're, the high school education in foreign countries is way ahead of us. And so they come in here and do real well. And uh, so those kids want to be here. Uh, we had two kids from Bonanza, Oregon in our top six when we won the national championship. Nobody recruits Bonanza, Oregon. <laughs> but we have, that was a starter and a sixth man. And the sixth man last year became first team all conference. And nobody wanted him. And, even myself, I'm going, gosh, I hope they can play here, but they work so hard and they battle. And uh, in fact, it was really funny. We played every state. They had three first team all Seattle players. And we were, they were matched up against two Bonanza guys and a guy from South Medford, you know. And uh, we beat them every time. And so that's been kind of fun because we won with, we had a Culver kid who became All American, a Boardman kid was National Player of the Year. We had a great player from Sherman County, great player from Lost River. We've had two from Bonanza, and just, you know, and we have a kid from Lakeview that's our best defensive player right now. So, the, and as far as recruiting goes, uh, I haven't made a home visit probably for 15 years because my players send players to me, you know, like the Australian kid we got, my player of 1998, who's a great player over there in Perth, Australia. He wants him to come here. He's, you know, you've got to go play at Oregon Tech. And so a lot of my guys, I get, especially now with the internet and all the cuts, I'll get seven, seven different countries will send me stuff every day. Kids from Bulgaria and Lithuania, and, you know, they're all over the place. So there's all kinds of players, and, and some of them will come from home. Some of them will sign without coming because uh, they had a friend or an ex-player. You know, the other kids will come down, or maybe the parents will come down for a visit. So that's pretty much how we recruit now. Yeah, I just have a comment. My husband and I are both alumni from 30 years ago. Okay. We started here. And we're from that evil metropolis, Beaverton. Right. And <laughs> so I know what you mean. Yeah. Because we 
always wanted our kids to come yeah. to OIT because we thought it was an awesome education and yeah. a great place to be, but we could never push it because it was what it was. Yeah. And when our daughter made the decision, it was a very independent decision. Right. And it was because she wanted to be in Crown Falls and she wanted to be here. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I, you know, when I say beaver to that's just a, No, I know what you mean. Because we're from that Arizona so I get it. Move it over to Sunset. <laughs> no, but uh, the, the thing is, it's just, uh, uh, you know, I think you understand, I want kids who want to be here. Yeah. And, and don't think, you know, they come in and say, like, they're doing it. I don't want kids to think they're doing us a favor. You know, we want them coming in and we want to be proud to be in the program and that they are going to have to sit probably a couple years before they get much playing time because we we're loyal to the kids that are a little bit older. Uh, and that's kind of how we do it. Well, I've only got to see one of your games, that, that, uh, and it happened to be the 900 win. Okay. My, my daughter says, Dad, you got to come up yeah. and watch these guys play basketball. Right. Because you like basketball. Yeah. These guys play basketball. Well, thank you. And, and thank I'm you. going, okay, but you know, I hadn't paid attention. We yeah. live in Eureka. Right. I used to go to Elmwood State yeah. and Tom Woods and yeah. the guys down there. Yeah. And uh, I came up and seen that. That 900 win, and that was just absolutely incredible. Plus, everyone was in pain. Yeah, we were, <laughs> well, that's a special night because yeah. it was uh, from our fan Dow, who was just a wonderful lady. She was uh, can't say enough about what kind of person she was. And then uh, her family came back, and then we we're playing Southern Oregon, it's our rival, and uh, 900 win. And there's a couple other things too. On their coach right now. Homecoming. Huh? Homecoming. Homecoming. Yeah, I mean, it was. Uh, I know my daughter kept saying, "We got to get there early." Yeah. We were there early. But it's. Uh, <laughs> we talk about it all the time. The, the elect, even though there's only 2,200 people there, the electricity and the gym. Oh, were, unbelievable! It's a. It was fantastic. Great environment. In fact, we went and played. We played the national tournament for a 9600 uh, one time, and, and there's 16,000 seats, but. It's not even close to the same environment, you know. You, uh, especially when you have everybody rooting for you, type of thing. So it's uh, pretty special. And we're we got a right now. We have a drive. Uh, said in the paper the other day. In fact, 1991, we were supposed to get a 5,000 seat arena built down here, and we we're really pretty excited about it. And then Major Five came through, and we had to drop a nine of the left. In fact, every one of us got fired. I got hired back the next day, and one of the women coaches got hired back because they had to take our tenure from us. And so we had came back with basketball and softball, and but that also took away the, the we were number one on the list of the new things we had built on the Oregon State campuses, and I don't know where it dropped. It's probably you know probably last on the list on that, but we're the only college around that has one gym, you know, and we have all these kids using one gym. We uh, you know even the high schools here all have two gyms, so we're we have not been. Uh, help very much, you know, with our athletic facilities. But uh, we are on a drive right now to raise 150,000. We're, we're going to get the gym that Kentucky won the regionals on the same floor. And uh, if we raise 150, we'll uh, uh, be putting it in before the season starts. With that, these are boosters raising them for us, plus the score clocks. So we have very nice score clocks up there now. The boosters did, and. Uh, this is a pretty nice looking gym right now, especially we get the new floor. And uh, so it's a very, it would be a very good facility, but you know, we've been on this drive for two days and I'll bet you we'll, we'll have the money within a week and a half. You know, it's just incredible how the people, and the other thing, when we go to the national tournament, we, it, Mike mentioned we've been there 17 times. We don't have money to go. It costs about $40,000. So we have a scrimmage before we leave. It's a, red shirts and the young kids against the old kids and uh, uh, upperclassmen and we have a scrimmage and then after the scrimmage the kids go thank the fans for being there all year and we have, they have some hot dogs different things that during the game they're handing out stuff and cake and stuff and but in one night like one year we got 40,000 one night just people and a lot of people can't afford to give them 25, 50, 75 because they're Oregon Tech guys too you know and uh, so I, I kind of feel like I mentioned yesterday I think we're kind of a Green Bay Packers thing here. It's kind of like the whole town believes are part of the Green Bay Packers. And Klamath Falls is, you know, they think they're Oregon Tech basketball. And it's a pretty neat relationship. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, we're wonderful, except Mike. Like, I'll tell you what, is, uh, I, I became a Christian nine years ago. And uh, when I say that, I'm uh, born again. And, uh, 
And so going on that trip, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen Hotel Rwanda or I so flagged up. Yeah. And last night I saw, uh, there's, uh, if you get a chance on the internet, it's called, why do you say it, Mike? Uh, it's uh, Ghosts, of, Ghosts of Rwanda. It's a frontline, you get a chance to watch this, an hour and 54 minutes, it's just unbelievable. But we were, a lot of those pictures of that was where we were. But what my job was, I'm going again this year, my wife and I thought it was the greatest experience of our lives. We stayed in a one-star hotel. We didn't have water a couple nights, and it doesn't matter, you know. It was, uh, and she got to go, she got to spend, uh, was the women of genocide, uh, there were 368 women walked for hours to be there. The women, when they husbands were murdered, they, they lost all their property. They basically become shunned women. So these women all walked there, and we had 52 of us on this trip. There were some Canadians, and there was about 20 women, women, 30 guys, about eight of us were coached, the rest of them were players, and uh, women and men basketball players. So what we were doing was we would be, we coached their national coaches how to coach, you know, their top coaches. There'd be about 70 of them from all over the country. And then in the afternoon, the kids would come, we'd coach them, and the coaches would watch how we coached the kids. And then my wife was like over the orphanages and stuff in the schools and slums, and with other women. But that one day when the women came, uh, our women washed their feet and prayed with them. And uh, uh, in fact, they have some videos of that. You can see uh, it's AIA, Athletes in Action, Rwanda. If you look at that, you can see some of that. My wife's in there. So, but it was a tremendous trip. Well, we're, we're going back again this year because uh, it's such so special. And uh, we'll be going Three days in Kenya, we're going to build a basketball court out of our court because they have no facilities. Last year we took 200, let's see, 200 basketballs, uh, nets, and everything. I had this one big, I had one group rotated to me, and the shortest guy was 6'8, the tallest guy was 7'2. And they're just buff, good looking kids. And so we were doing drills, and they really picked things up fast. So then we got in a game, the big 7'2 kid caught the ball and turned, shot about four footer, and went over the backboard. They, they don't have any baskets to shoot at, or, you know, so they they have no baskets and, and they have no basketballs. They want to play, they see it on TV, but they, and then so what happens is a lot of those kids come over here and they, I always felt the, the African kids are playing a level higher than they should because their bodies look so good. You know, they look like they played a high level, but it should be a lower level because they haven't played enough, you know, they don't have the instinct and stuff. But it, was a, it was a tremendous trip. Anything else? Well, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.